presentation, COVID-19, get the facts about the vaccine. Our goal is to inform the community by providing facts about the COVID-19 vaccinations, and we could not have asked for a better representative to provide these facts than our guest speaker who will be announced in just a few moments. Please note that this presentation is being recorded for further review and sharing. Also, there will be time at the end of the presentation to submit questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please do not use the chat box. I would like to introduce Elms College President, Dr. Harry Dumay. Dr. Dumay has served in higher education for over 20 years. Prior to assuming the presidency of Elms College, Dr. Dumay held senior and executive level positions with Anselm College, Harvard University's Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, Boston College Graduate School of Social Work, and Boston University School of Engineering. He serves on various boards, including the New England Commission for Higher Education, the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Massachusetts, the Association of Colleges of Sisters of St. Joseph, the Boston Foundation's Haiti Development Institute, Pope Francis Preparatory School, Build Health International, and Norwich University. Please welcome Dr. Dumay. Thank you, Jesse. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining us today for the Elms College COVID vaccination information and presentation. Before we get into a program, um, let's just spend a minute to think about the victims of these senseless mass murders in Georgia. As we gather today, our thoughts and prayers are with the eight victims of the senseless mass murders this week and with their family. With six of the eight victims being Asian American women, and with the increase in violence and racist acts against Asian Americans this past year, the Elms community stands in solidarity with our Asian American brothers and sisters. We want our Asian American friends, starting with members of our community, to know that you are not invisible. To paraphrase Dr. King, injustice toward anyone, anywhere, is a threat to justice to everyone, everywhere. Darkness and bigotry will never prevail. A commitment here at the Elms is to embracing, embracing and cherishing the uniqueness that each person brings. Now next week will mark one year day to day when hitting the governor's guidelines, Elms College and other institutions shut our campuses and took teaching, learning and working remotely. We've been fighting the COVID-19 pandemic since then. As a college community, we have much to be proud of in terms of our collective response over the past months. With vaccination timeline announced for everyone in Massachusetts this week, we are indeed very hopeful about re a return to some approximation of life before COVID soon. And we were blessed today to have the opportunity to hear from the regional expert on the facts about the vaccine. Dr. Artenstein, thank you so much for making the time to be with us this afternoon to share your expertise and inform the Elms College community about the scientific facts that are known about the vaccine at this time. On behalf of the students, faculty, staff, and trustees of the college, allow me to extend to you the warmest Blazers welcome. Let me also thank everyone who has made this presentation possible. Bevan Peters, my executive assistant, and Elizabeth Newland, the student affairs administrative assistant, have worked behind the scene to make sure that all logistical items for this presentation are well coordinated. Thank you, Bevan and Liz. Our health center advisory board coordinated today's event. The advisory board is chaired by the VP of Student Affairs and Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Antoinette Kendia Bailey, who cannot be with us today. And it is comprised of the Dean of the School of Nursing, Dr. Kathleen Scoble, 
Associate Dean for Undergraduate Nursing Programs, Brother Michael Duffy, the Shawness Chair in Humanities and Executive Director of the Center for Ethics, Religion and Culture, Dr. Peter DePogola, the Dean of Students, Teresa Winters, the Director of the Health Center, Jesse Chenier, and the Director of Marketing and Communication, Linda Rose. Over the past months, the advisory board has been invaluable in helping the health center to navigate complex decisions around challenging COVID cases. I thank the advisory board, Jesse, and the staff of the health center for their unyielding dedication in keeping the campus healthy. As a close-knit academic community, we have come to realize that we are each other's keepers and that I am safe if you are safe. Dr. Attenstein's presentation today will help us to be equipped with facts as we continue to endeavor to protect ourselves, each other, and our entire community. So thank you all for being here and for continuing to be Elms safe. Thank you, Dr. Demay. After receiving the, the MD degree from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Dr. Ardenstein completed residency training in internal medicine, both at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC. During 10 years from 1986 to 1996 of total active duty service as a physician in the US Army Medical Corps, he also served as the head section of protective immunity in the division of retrobiology at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. There, he led a component of the laboratory-based and global epidemiologic efforts to develop the foundation for the US military's HIV-1 prophylactic vaccine trials in Thailand, successfully aligning multiple culturally and nationally desperate entities in service to a common goal. Later at Memorial Hospital of Rhode Island, Alpert Medical School of Brown University, he created the Center for Biodefense and Emerging Pathogens and became its founding director from 2001 to 2012, responsible for coordinating epidemic and pandemic effort preparedness efforts, multi-site vaccine trials, including the pivotal new generation smallpox vaccine, national level consultative services, a basic science laboratory effort focusing on anthrax, antitoxin, therapeutic approaches and developing universal countermeasure therapeutics for bio threat agents and multifaceted educational programs. In 2004, Dr. Ardenstein was selected to be the physician in chief at MHRI leading to department leading the Department of Medicine and serving as the senior physician for there. From 2012 to 2016, he served as the chair of medicine, Bay State Health and the Tufts University School of Medicine chair of medicine at Bay State. Since 2016, he has served Bay State Health in the following roles, chief physician executive and chief academic officer, president of the 1200 member employed academic provider group, the regional executive dean of the University of Massachusetts Medical School, UMass Bay State. Dr. Ardenstein has published more than 110 scholarly works in the medical literature, serves on the editorial advisory board of the Journal of Infectious Diseases and served as an associate editor of the journal Vaccine. He is the author of two books, In the Blink of an Eye, The Deadly Story of the Epidemic Meningitis, Meningitis excuse me, and the lead author and editor of Vaccines, a biography. He served for eight years on the Scientific Steering Committee of the New England Regional Center of Excellence in Biodefense at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Ardenstein has also served in a variety of other advisory, administrative, and scientific roles within Brown University, University of Massachusetts Medical School, NIH, and in several ad hoc roles with state and federal governments and industry. Please welcome Dr. Andrew Ardenstein. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to uh, President Dumais for those uh, thoughtful and heartfelt comments. 
uh, which I echo completely. Um, and it's great to be with you all. I'm looking forward, as I was saying earlier, uh, to the time when we can be together in person safely, which is coming soon, I think. Uh, and we'll talk about that as the, uh, as, uh, the hour goes on. Uh, if I could have the first slide, please. I have very few slides. I'll just tell you up front, I'm a person of few slides, uh, but hopefully uh, lots of discussion. I am open and I encourage a question uh, as you were instructed earlier, the, the, the process on any facet of this you'd like to discuss. I'm really open to discuss anything. I'd like, I'd like to learn uh, from the audience, uh, especially an academic audience like this has a lot to teach me. Uh, next slide, please. But I li I'd like to start, thank you, with, with just an update, just so we're all calibrated and we're all kind of aligned with the same general data set. And you may know some of this, but I just want to uh, be very transparent about uh, as of at least midnight yesterday, the situation update with the pandemic. And, and we follow this, as you may imagine, uh, uh, hourly. Um, so to date, globally, over 120 million confirmed cases and 2.7 million deaths globally. 30 million cases in the US, which represents over 9% of our entire population. Uh, think about that for a second, 9%. Uh, and those are confirmed cases. So let's just be clear. A confirmed case is a virologic tested positive case that has uh, uh, somehow gotten to testing. Most of the time that's through some kind of symptoms. Occasionally it's an asymptomatic person. So 30 million confirmed out of a 330 million population. The estimates from uh, most epidemiologic models suggest that that is uh, the actual number of infected has over the past year has been somewhere three to four fold that number. So somewhere between 30 and 40% of the American population has likely been infected with this virus over the course of the year. Only 10% of the total have been uh, diagnosed, about 25% of that total, I should say. 540,000 deaths. I'm gonna put that in perspective for you. That's why I have the little talking bullet point, mortality context. This is critically important. The, uh, you heard early on that this is no different than influenza, than the flu, the seasonal flu. That's not the case. On an average year, seasonal influenza kills between 12,000 and 60,000 people in the United States. And rarely is that number in the top half of that range. That would be a really bad epidemic flu year. And we've had those every probably uh, once or twice per decade since the 50s, we've had those kind of years where 50 or 60,000 people die, mostly of secondary complications, heart and lung disease, pneumonia, things like that. 540,000 deaths. Let me put it in another perspective for you. That's one year, because it's been exactly last week, one year to the day that we had our first case at Bay State Health. Uh, 540,000 deaths is just under what we lose on an annual basis from heart disease, the number one killer in the United States, or cancer, the number two killer in the United States. Now the difference between, first of all, uh, the difference between those illnesses and this illness, this is an acute respiratory illness. So you're healthy one minute, you're sick and potentially have died the next. Heart disease and cancer do not generally occur as acute illnesses. They're chronic illnesses. They're accretive, which means their prevalence rates are uh, additive year over year. So the denominator is much bigger of people afflicted with the illness. One more mortality context point. If you look back at the last pandemic of this magnitude, which you'd have to look 100 years. So no one was really around professionally active in medicine 100 years ago. There were some people who were alive, certainly. Uh, but if you look at uh, medicine 100 years ago, the, the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, which lasted roughly 16 to 18 months, I'll show you a curve in a minute. There were 675,000 estimated deaths in America, 675,000. So we are already uh, about 85% of the way there. That was the worst catastrophe in uh, modern medicine. That was uh, 18 months, and there were no antibiotics, no antivirals, and no vaccines. So think about that. No critical care units, no mechanical ventilators. 
yet we've almost lost the same number of people. The reason I tell you that, and this goes to the uh, sentiments of Dr. Dumay earlier, let's take a second to reflect on the victims that we've lost, the people we've lost in the US and globally over the last year. And those are underestimates. Remember, a, a lot more people have probably died. They, their deaths have not been attributed to this. Hospitalizations, we're now at about 40,000 per day in the United States. We were at one point over 100,000, over 120,000 a day, not that long ago. So this is substantial improvement. We're still not quite at the nadir. We are at about where we were following the first, the, the uh, reduction in the first surge. We're not quite where we were last summer, which was lower. In Massachusetts, we've had over 600,000 cases. Our test positive rate is about three and a half percent people go and get tested, about three and a half percent of those are positive. That does not include the higher education testing, which tends to dilute that number because they're folks like uh, the Elms College and lots of other universities are testing people appropriately, but they're testing a lot of healthy people, so it reduces that percentage. Uh, hospitalizations in Massachusetts are going down as well. In the counties, if you look at the county data, Hamden County, where my organization resides and where your organization resides is uh, the highest uh, prevalence in the state at this moment. 24.7 cases per 100,000 people. Uh, it's lower than it was. It was above 60 about six weeks ago. Uh, they're all coming down, but it's still pretty high and it's considered in the red yellow, turning yellow. So it's improving. And then I'll talk about viral variants uh, as we go a little further. Next slide, please. Let me just show you what the epidemic curve looks like for Bay State Health. And this mirrors the epidemic curve regionally, statewide, nationally, and globally. So you can see we had a, a, an abrupt, accelerated, rapid peak uh, a year ago. In fact, uh, this time last year, we pretty much were, uh, as they say in uh, Goodfellas, we, we had hit the mattresses. Uh, we were working 24 seven, seven uh, and uh, trying to get our arms around this rapidly moving pandemic. Uh, but you can see the duration of that first surge. It was uh, rapid to the peak, slow decline, but much faster decline than our second wave, which we are just on the downside of currently. So look at that curve for a second. Um, and then the next curve, please. Next slide, please. So this is the 1918-1919 pandemic influenza curve. These are deaths, but hospitalizations follows the same shape. So this is just a surrogate. And I think you can see here, just if you look at the shape of the curve, uh, there, the peak of their deaths was the second wave, actually. And there are several reasons for that. But the key here to, to, that I really want you to see is about 16 months after the inception of the pandemic, you can see this third wave. And I just want to touch, uh, use this to remind myself that we are not out of the woods of a third wave. I'm not trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, scare people. It's just, I think it's reasonable to reflect on this, uh, that this is really our last pandemic of this magnitude experience. And there was a third wave. It was lower in magnitude than the, than the peak and it was uh, shorter in duration. And I, I'm gonna speak to that, but just remember that was all based on natural immunity. So their entire immune protection in 1918 was for people who recovered from infection. Now we have a vaccine which sets us apart and, and helps us potentially avoid a third wave. Next, please. So, Let's turn to vaccination, but before I do, let me just mention the variants that you've heard so much about. I'm going to leave plenty of time, which I hope we can have some discussion. Uh, so first of all, the viral variants. The virus that causes COVID-19, which is a SARS coronavirus. It's, so as many of you may recall, or some of you may recall, in 2003 and four um, in Asia, with some exportation to other parts of the world, including the US but, and Canada and Western Europe, there was a virus uh, called SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome virus caused by a novel coronavirus. 
This is a cousin, this coronavirus, it's coronavirus two is a cousin of that original virus genetically linked, but not the same. They are both RNA viruses. And by the way, coronaviruses exist, uh, have existed, we've known about them for 75 years. Uh, and they, uh, they've been around longer than that. Uh, they're called coronaviruses because they have a, a set of spike proteins on their uh, external coat, which looks kind of like the crown of a monarch uh, under the electron microscope. Coronaviruses, other than SARS, typically cause common colds or those kinds of mild respiratory uh, illnesses. Uh, and they, they run in the whole family of viruses that cause common colds. Then there, became, then there came SARS, which arose out of civet cats, uh, a, a, uh, a small mammal in Asia, in Asian markets, and then rapidly spread to other animals and then cross species to humans. And then shortly thereafter, within a decade, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, which was also a coronavirus, MERS. SARS kind of disappeared into the ether uh, after causing about uh, 8,000 cases uh, and about a 10% death rate. And uh, it just never reappeared as far as we know. MERS has kind of been very geographically uh, isolated to a certain part of the world, the Middle East. Uh, and it has kind of stayed steady at very low levels. But the reason we know so much so quickly about COVID in terms of the biology of the virus and the reason we were able to move so quickly into vaccination science is because there had been a, a great deal of basic science and industry work in the 2000s and 2010s around SARS and then MERS. So we had a basically a, a two decade head start on this in terms of the basic science because they are closely linked biologically. That's the really good news. I'm gonna talk more about the timeline of vaccines in a second. That gets me to the variants. These are RNA viruses. That means their genetic core is uh, ribonucleic acid. RNA viruses classically, and influenza is a classic one, classically do not have a proofreading function in their genetic code. They, they replicate billions and billions of times a day in people's bodies or in animal bodies, and they make mistakes. Uh, just it's natural. Mistakes are made in the replication of genetic material. Viruses are no different. And the more you replicate, the more mistakes you might make. Most of those RNA viruses cannot proofread their replication. The COVID virus, on the other hand, does have a proofreading gene and it's able to proofread. So correct mistakes that occur in replication, but it can't correct all the mistakes. And in fact, some of those mistakes actually enhance the survival of the virus or provide some factor like its, its transmissibility, its contagiousness, or its virulence, something that in some way aids the virus in its journey. Viruses are programmed to survive. They don't have a thought process. They're programmed to survive. So they actually, the way their biology works is it works towards optimal survival. Now, they don't always work in their best advantage because if a virus goes into a host and kills the host and can't transmit elsewhere, then that's a dead end for the virus. But the more transmissible a virus is, the more survival. You can infect a lot more hosts that way. Even if you kill some, you get into others. And that's really the way they propagate. This virus has a proofreading function, but there are still variants that arise because mistakes are made. And some of those mistakes are advantageous. And you've heard about at least three. They're called by their geographic names, even though they also have scientific code. Uh, the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant. And take my word for it, there, there will be other variants identified. They exist. They will be found in the US. These already have to a small degree, but there will be more and there'll be a higher penetrance because we have free mobile travel. People move freely about the world for the most part. We have airplanes, which can get you from Bangkok to Detroit in less than 24 hours. So uh, you can, you know, viruses are passengers just like the rest of us. Uh, and there will be these variants. So that's not surprising. Uh, they still need to be addressed, though. 
And we still don't know uh, necessarily, uh, one, do they have increased virulence factors like transmissibility and virulence? Some seem to have more transmissibility, for instance, the South African variant. Uh, some seems to be, seem to be potentially more virulent, that is more dangerous, such as the Brazilian variant. And it's not clear though, whether they can evade vaccine or natural protection. Remember, there's two types of immune protection. By the way, I did send out a PDF of a, a, a wonderful review article on vaccines, general vaccines, if anyone's interested. Just for background, it, it doesn't specifically talk about COVID vaccine. Um, there are really two types of protection in, in virology and viral uh, science. One is natural immunity that you get from getting infected with the virus and recovering. Uh, and the second is artificial immunity that you get from, uh, in most cases, a vaccine. There are other ways to do that as well. Uh, it's either way, it's active, and that means your own immune system has to provide the defense. But one is provoked by the natural infection, and one is provoked by a synthetic version of that. And we'll talk about that. So the key for the variance is we're still learning. So I can answer, I'm happy to answer questions, but I don't have a ton of answers because we're learning as we go. This has been one year, basically, a little over, December 19 to now, so 14 months. And we are still learning about all of these things. This is rapidly evolving as a pandemic is expected to be. Uh, so vaccination. So I told you why we got, there's a couple other reasons why I think the vaccine went from start to finish, essentially, or at least first generation finish in a year. Uh, it's unprecedented. You've heard that, I hope, that this is really not usual. It's not to be expected. A couple of reasons. One, we had a uh, 15 to 17 year head start on the science. I mentioned that. Two, uh, in, the, in, the, in the clutches of a worldwide pandemic, all scientific talent and dollars and federal government dollars from the US and other governments have been firmly focused on an answer to this problem. When you do that in science, you typically get the best and brightest minds on something and they can, they can address this like no, one, no one's business. If you look back at the polio vaccine effort and the March of Dimes, that was a government academic partnership and with private industry as well back in the um, 40s and 50s and late 40s and 50s. And that went uh, very quickly and very quickly then was seven, eight years. Uh, very quickly now you can see is a year. So that's another reason why we move fast on this. The other reason was that uh, since the early eighties, we have known and been battling HIV on a scientific basis. So for over 40 years, though some of the world's best and brightest scientists have been involved in the HIV pandemic and solutions to that. It's a different disease entirely, a different virus. It's a chronic illness. It's not an acute viral disease, but, uh, and so getting to a vaccine has proven extremely difficult, but the immunology science advancement that's derived from the study of HIV has led us in directions that we couldn't have dreamt about 40 years ago. So we have all of that knowledge in tow, a new pathogen, COVID, and a lot of talent and dollars going into it, you can see why we have a vaccine in a year. Uh, that's, that's record time, so we should all be proud of the scientific achievement. Um, and here's what's happened. We've currently in the US deployed about uh, 74 million uh, doses of vaccine, uh, 70 more, I'm sorry, 74 million people have been vaccinated at some level. Um, there's 267 eligible. That excludes children under the age of 16. In some states, not everyone is eligible. I know that. But right now, children are not even considered to be eligible until, uh, until the studies are in. So if you look at those partially vaccinated, uh, 74 million. If, if you look at those fully vaccinated, uh, about 38 million. So it's, it's almost 12% of our population is fully vaccinated and over 20% are partially vaccinated. We're up to two and a half million doses a day. Uh, that is significantly more threefold higher than we were a month ago. 
Now, so that's good news. Massachusetts is eighth in the nation in, in uh, people vaccinated, 26%, uh, but only about 14th in the nation in those who've been fully vaccinated, meaning received both doses. But we're doing pretty well in Massachusetts. A slow start, but we've caught up as you thought we would probably. Uh, at Bay State Health, we started vaccinations on the 16th of December, uh, and we have given over 50,000 doses to eligible populations. We're only vaccinating what the Massachusetts Department of Public Health allows us to do, um, and we get a small allocation every week, so we don't really have a lot of leeway. Uh, we have vaccinated more than 80% of Bay State Health team members, employees. That We have 12,500 employees. Um, that's a pretty good number. And what you're going to find is that's going to be a lot higher than the national penetrance when we get there in terms of all, all people, uh, which is likely to be closer to 60 to 65 percent, I would guess, hopefully higher. Um, and we've had about 2,000 people decline for various reasons, and we honor that. But the declinations, a lot, most of them were wait and see declinations, which is good news. They weren't people who were against vaccination. They were people who were just a little uh, unsure because this is an experimental vaccine until it's FDA approved. And it's brand new. It's new technology, the first generation. And uh, they've wanted to wait and see how things shaked out. Now, as it turns out, uh, every week we get about 20 to 80 of those people uh, changing their mind and wanting to be vaccinated. So that's come down from about 2,400. So we're doing pretty well. And I think at some point it will whittle further down. We also take a small subsection of our allocation weekly and we give 15% of it to the uh, community health centers in Springfield. There are three of them that we own and operate to, to take care of the, the city's most vulnerable people at Brightwood, uh, Mason Square and High Street Health Centers. Um, and we are uh, responsible for them for their care, uh, where they're actually part of our Medicaid Accountable Care Organization. And, and we partner with Caring Health in downtown Springfield. And so we make sure that those folks who are eligible at those health centers have easy access to the vaccine. And we also send several hundred doses a week to our most rural vulnerable population up in the Greenfield area in Franklin County. So we want to be sure we at least uh, are trying to achieve some equity and distribution from a very small number of doses we get. Next slide, please. So just to sum this up in terms of the vaccine situation, and then I really uh, want to uh, base my comments on the questions that might be out there, because I think they're going to be more enlightening than me uh, just uh, droning on. Uh, one is that we have about over 20 vaccine products that are in large-scale advanced clinical trials. For those of you who aren't in the business, uh, vaccine trials come really in four phases. The first phase, phase one, are really dose-ranging, dose-finding safety studies. So they are small numbers of human beings. I'm talking about human trials now. Vaccines typically have had to go through basic science, cellular studies, animal studies, large animal studies. Some of those have been uh, truncated for this effort. But uh, large scale human clinical trials, phase one are just safety and dosing studies, small numbers. Phase two are larger versions of that, where you've got a dose that seems optimal, but now you're doing larger scale safety and immunogenicity studies, trying to figure out if the vaccine induces the proper immune response in a laboratory uh, by testing blood usually. Phase three are what's called pivotal clinical studies, that's the 21 I'm talking about. Those are studies of large numbers, thousands, dozens of thousands of people that are usually placebo controlled. So there's a group getting saltwater vaccine and there's a group getting the product and you do it uh, for X amount of months and you monitor them closely for all sorts of safety metrics and efficiency metrics. There are six of those have been approved. That's world record. I mean, that's like Usain Bolt type of world record speed. Um, the first two out of the gate were the messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna constructs that I think you've heard about probably exhaustively. We have never had a approved 
messenger RNA vaccine for human use. These are the first two ever. Now we've, the, the scientific community has been experimenting and hypothesizing about messenger RNA vaccines for two decades. Uh, and some of them were used in trials for Ebola and for dengue fever and for cancer and for other things. But these are the first two that got to large scale pivotal clinical studies proved to be efficacious and safe and have been put into large scale human arms, now millions of humans across the globe. We have another group of vaccines that are called viral vectored vaccines. And this is in that review article I gave you, it describes different types of vaccines. There are three that are either on the market or are about to be on the market. You've heard about the J&J &J vaccine, a single dose. You might've heard about the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V, which is now, uh, they are uh, collaborating with some big pharmaceutical industrial giants. You've heard about AstraZeneca because you've been reading the newspaper and learning about the blood clots in Europe that may or may not be connected to this vaccine. Those are vectored vaccines. Okay, I'll, what that is, is a messenger RNA vaccine, what it does is it, it injects messenger RNA that is synthetically made in the laboratory that looks like the genetic material of the COVID virus. It's not COVID, it can't cause COVID, but it's a small piece of the genetic material that codes for the spike protein that sits on the outside, remember I told you, that looks like the thorns of a crown uh, to scientists in an electron microscope. Those spike proteins, if you develop antibody against those spike proteins, they can prevent the virus from entering your cells. So they can be protective. So the whole goal here was to develop a human antibody response to those proteins. One tactic to do that is to inject messenger RNA. It is like the blueprint that explains to your body how to make the antibody that you then make to the spike protein. So the time, if you ever see the spike protein coming into your body from the COVID virus, it prevents it from entering. The viral vectored vaccines have a similar goal. They just do it differently. Instead of injecting messenger RNA, you inject a harmless virus called an adenovirus. It's a vector. All it does is carry a piece of the protein of the, of the COVID virus into your body so that your cells recognize it as foreign material. They make antibody to it. And then the next time they see it, the antibody springs to life and protects you. So that's another way to get the same outcome. The third type are these protein-based vaccines, which again, the idea is, is to use this spike protein, a piece of it, to teach the body how to defend itself. So that's the Novavax construct. And then this other vaccine, which is a Chinese construct, is an attenuated vaccine. The attenuation means a weakened state. So it's a weakened version of a portion of the virus. It does, it, it does not cause COVID or it's inactivated, which means it's killed. Doesn't cause COVID, but it, it has a lot of the constructs, the, the uh, structure that your body can then start to form antibodies against. These are the, the trick with vaccines, it's very similar for all of these strategies. The tactics, they, I mean, the strategy is to induce your body to recognize these proteins. They're foreign proteins, so your body makes antibodies. And the next time you need it, it revs into shape and it starts producing gobs of those antibodies to prevent the virus from entering or from attacking cells or from doing its dirty deeds. Um, that's the thing with these vaccines. There's lots of other novel approaches to vaccines. I only wrote down the five for which there is a product already a, somewhere approved or used in the world. You'll see more of these. I said there's 21 in late stage trials. Not all of those will succeed, but you'll see more. One more thing I wanna mention, these mRNA vaccines proved to be 90 to 95%, actually 93 to 95% efficacious in the large clinical studies. The difference between ef efficacy and effectiveness, I just wanna make sure you understand this. In vaccine, in vaccinology, efficacy means what a drug or vaccine looks like under the most stringent conditions of a clinical trial, where you're, you're seeing those volunteers every day or three times a week, you're interrogating them with questions, you're drawing 
uh, tubes filled with blood. That's not real life. That's a clinical trial. Um, 90 to 93 to 95% efficacious. You don't get much better than that. I mean, that's, in fact, you don't get much better than that. It's impossible. Um, so that's like the best you'll ever see with very few serious, no serious side effects and, and even uh, only a small number of moderate systemic side effects. Most people just got sore arms. Some people had more, you know, fevers, chills, muscle aches. We saw a lot of that, but it's short lived and it's related to the vaccine and people get better. Um, the J and J vaccine, I think you've been hearing about. It's the first viral vectored out of the chute in the United States. It's a one dose vaccine. You've heard it's only seventy three percent efficacious. That's true in the studies. Now keep in mind those studies were done in foreign countries where there were variants already circulating, so it was not as effective against some of those variants. So that diluted down the efficacy. The mRNA vaccines were, those trials were done before the variants arose, or at least were recognized. So that was one advantage they had over the vector. The second is that, but the J&J vaccine was over 90% effective in preventing serious illness or death due to COVID. So even the people that broke through and got a COVID infection did not get sick. Now, the ultimate goal in vaccine science and in human medicine is to prevent serious illness, uh, certainly to prevent death. Uh, I think most of us would trade a common cold, mild illness for a hospitalization or a critical care stay or obviously anything worse. Uh, so that's the one thing I'll say. And when people ask me, including my, you know, my 35-year-old son, I tell him, uh, if you can get the j j vaccine now, but are told you have to wait six weeks to get the mRNA vaccine, get the J&J &J vaccine, because uh, you don't want to get seriously ill from this. Okay. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is this concept of sterilizing immunity. That means that you get vaccinated and that vaccine prevents you from even getting infected asymptomatically with the bug. Okay, that's, that's ideal. Sterilizing immunity is an ideal goal, but we don't see it with all vaccines. And we tolerate infections with many things as long as they're not serious. The problem with this virus is we're, we're trying to get out of a pandemic. We're trying to achieve herd immunity, which means people are protected e even indirectly. So there may be people who don't get vaccinated because they can't for whatever reason, uh, or because they don't want it for whatever reason. Yet we still want to know that there's protection in our environment, whether you've been vaccinated or not. The only way to do that is to get enough immunity in the population that the virus transmission slows to almost nothing. Then you've, then you've won the war. Um, and sterilizing immunity helps with that because there's no asymptomatic infections in people who are vaccinated. We don't yet know whether these vaccines result in sterilizing immunity. So there's still a possibility that you can be fully vaccinated and theoretically a small number of people could get infected and not know it. Why do I say that? Because those studies of Pfizer and Moderna, they did not assess the volunteers for asymptomatic infection. They only assessed them for symptomatic infection. That's why 95% efficacy is pretty good. We don't know whether there were any asymptomatic, so we can't say yet. The studies are going on as we speak. That's why you'll hear our health authorities and myself say, you got to still wear masks because it's possible that even if you're vaccinated, you could get in a situation where there's infection being transmitted, theoretically develop an asymptomatic transmission, won't hurt you because you're vaccinated, but you may then be around someone who's not vaccinated and they need to be protected also. So this is really a public health issue we need to act with some selflessness. And that's, uh, uh, with all due respect to all of us, that's difficult for Americans to do sometimes. That's our goal, but it's not in the, you know, uh, 1776 DNA of America. Um, but we have to start thinking differently. We have to, we have to really uh, worry and care about the public health rather than just individual health. Both are important, but we get, as, as I think uh, your president said, um, if there's, you know, I, I would paraphrase that to, to infection. If there's infection anywhere, there's infection everywhere. 
Uh, and that's the way infectious diseases and pandemics work. Something that happens in China is concerning to us. Something that happens here is concerning to the folks in Russia uh, because we live in a mobile society. I think that's my last slide. Uh, I hope it is uh, for the sake of everybody. Oh, <laughs> so the final thing I just wanted to show you, I'm, don't worry, don't worry. We're not gonna talk about this. I just want you to see, this is a viral life cycle uh, from le upper left to lower uh, to upper right. And each point in the viral life cycle, there is a potential point where a vaccine or a drug uh, medicine could have an impact. And I just want you to know that there are, there's work going on in every single possible place where there could be an Achilles heel of this virus. Entry, which is the, top, the left side, the entry of the virus is where most of the work so far has occurred, but some of the antivirals work by affecting replication. That's all I wanted to show you here was that there's a rhyme, a method to the madness, as it were. So I think I'm done, folks, and I'm gonna count on some help to, uh, to deal with questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ardenstein. That was extremely informative. At this time, Megan Jovalette, a senior nursing student at Elms College, will field some questions submitted through the Q&A box. So our first question that came in is, what is your opinion on immunity and post-vaccine behaviors? It seems like there is a great deal of controversy when listening to the news. Well, that's a good question, and you're, they're absolutely I think they speak for everyone. There's a great deal of, uh, of chatter out there. There's a lot of uh, conflicting uh, views. Some are opinion and some are conflicting about the science, frankly. The, I think the key message here, and again, I don't wanna get into the uh, opinion because there, there are reasonable people on multiple different sides of this. But again, I would make the plea from a public health standpoint. My feeling about this, there will be a time when we've, rolled out enough vaccine to enough people and enough Americans have been infected, that combination, those two things, fully vaccinated plus previously infected in the last year, because we don't know how long those, that immunity lasts. That's the number of people who have immunologic protection, whatever that percentage is. Right now, it's probably around 50%, but we don't know how long some of that immunity will last. Until that gets up above 75, probably closer to 80 plus percent, uh, depending on what the variants do, because if those variants can break through the vaccine, then all bets are off for the time being. We'll need better vaccines. But we're not going to be able to stop wearing masks, for instance, or get back to the place where we're all sitting together in a small conference room, elbow to elbow. We're not ready to do that yet. I think we will be probably one day probably won't be long. I'm thinking Labor Day at, or slightly thereafter, maybe into 22 before we're actually having those types of meetings. But we've made it through the, the hardest part of this marathon. I think we need to finish the race here. We need to finish this safely. That's been my mantra to the Bay State Health team. Let's finish what we started here and let's not be silly at this point. We've come too far. Too many people have lost their lives and too many people have sacrificed from their families for us to turn back. A little more caution and care is the right thing to do. Now, does that mean that you can also be practical? Of course. Uh, and if you're in a room with three other vaccinated people that you are intimate with, meaning you're friendly with and you do things with, you can probably look more normal than you did six months ago. Uh, but you know, in my hospital with 18% of our people declining vaccines so far, and none of our patients being fully vaccinated, or most of them not, we're not taking any chances. So our next question is, will a yearly COVID booster shot be needed moving forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good and, and, uh, and uh, that's a question that's under a lot of exploration as we speak. If you want, I can give you the, historically, the answer would probably be yes, maybe not yearly, but some kind of cadence whether it's every other year, every year, every three years, most vaccines require some boost. And in this case, I suspect they will, especially because of the variation in viruses that we're seeing. Um, but we don't know the cadence yet. Uh, we, and we don't know the duration of vaccine immunity yet. So the answer is 
Probably yes. It might not be like influenza where it's a seasonal vaccine. That's a different reason for that actually. Uh, but it could be either yearly or every other or something like that. I would suspect yes. Thank you. Our next question is going to be, should parents of young children be concerned with school starting back up? Yeah, again, these are great questions, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people that believes uh, at the beginning, I, I think the right paths were taken a year ago. Uh, I think now is the time where, where I think, our, should parents be concerned? I think when teachers are vaccinated and they are getting vaccinated in Massachusetts and all over the country, uh, I think uh, that will protect the teachers who are at greater risk, I think, than the children. Uh, children don't die of this typically. All the, you know, some do, but the, but the numbers are low. Uh, but they can be vectors for transmission to other people who can get sick and die from this, like grandparents and people with uh, altered immunity. So we don't want children getting infected either, even if they're not that sick, because they can transmit. But I do think schools are safe. Will will be can be made to be safe places now. Uh, I'd like to see the teachers vaccinated and the other workers. Thank you for that, Dr. Ardenstein. So our next question is, we have a policy at the college for regular COVID testing. What is your opinion for testing following full vaccination? Yeah, uh, that, that's a hard, I mean, again, I love these questions because they're right on. Uh, and I, I use it, you know, it's great for me because I usually don't think about it from the point of view of uh, higher education, but I should. We have a lot, we do our own education, but it's not that quite the same. Uh, it's more in a clinical environment uh, fully. But so first of all, because we get asked this, when are we going to stop testing uh, our patients before they get procedures? Because right now, everyone who comes into this hospital or any of our hospitals or any of our facilities has to be tested before they can get anything done. Or if they're getting admitted, they have to be tested even if they're getting admitted for something which is in no way connected. Um, when can we stop that? And the answer is when, when more people have been vaccinated. The answer for the students is, I would think, uh, probably the same thing. Uh, as vaccine rolls out, I think then we can start to, uh, to uh, reverse that process. Schools, actually colleges and universities, I think have done a really good job. Uh, I'm sure it's at great cost and effort. Uh, I have no doubt, but uh, it's actually, uh, I think prevented and a lot of infections and made life a lot better for a lot of people. So I applaud that. Thank you. So our next question is going to be, do you foresee that the COVID vaccination will be required for healthcare professionals just as we experienced with the flu vaccine? Yeah, I'll be honest. Well, first, let me say that it was a fight to get the flu vaccine mandatory. I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, and I could speak, uh, I've been multiple places and each place has been a fight except the army. No one fought in the army. Uh, you walk through the door, they vaccinate you. Uh, there was no fight, but in, uh, at Walter Reed, everyone was vaccinated back in 19, uh, beginning. I was there from 86 to 96, but, uh, but it's the right thing to do to protect our patients and each other, but mostly, you know, we take care of vulnerable people at their most vulnerable. Uh, so I think that, uh, the answer is probably at some point, but remember, this is not a fully FDA approved. None of these vaccines have been FDA approved. Now, probably they will be by the end of the year, at least some of them, but they're under emergency use authorization. By the way, never in my career for almost 36 years have I seen three vaccines within three months have emergency use authorization. That's unheard of. It's the right thing, but it's unheard of. Um, so we really can't mandate vaccines. They're still considered theoretically experimental products until they're FDA approved. So uh, even though they're authorized, so probably not this year, probably not next year, but probably uh, this, this virus is not gonna probably go away. It's gonna become something different. It will likely become uh, endemic. That's a word that we use to mean it's part of our uh, infectious landscape, just like common colds and influenza and things like that. It's just something that's out there, but it won't be pandemic anymore. So I think at some point it's likely uh, they will probably take look more like flu. Thank you for that. So our next question is, is it true that younger, healthier people are having more symptoms or reactions to the vaccines than older people are? Yeah, that is actually true. Now, those aren't serious reactions, though. They're still in the realm of what we consider to be mild to moderate. Uh, 
older folks, and unfortunately for those of you on the call, the definition of older is uh, for this vaccine study was 55. Sorry about that. But uh, the, uh, the, th those folks tend to do better. Why? We know your immune system ages as you get older and your immune system, the vigor of your immune system is what uh, really prompts a lot of those symptoms like sore arms and fevers and chills and muscle aches and headaches and things like that. Uh, that's a big, a lot of that is from immune activation, which by the way, is a really good thing. Uh, and that's why it's okay if you have a sore arm and feel a little punky after you get the vaccine, that's normal. Um, but yes, older folks tend to do better and the second dose tends to be worse than the first in terms of symptoms. But uh, I vaccinate, I've been involved in the vaccination of 50,000 people with this and I have not seen a, or 50,000 doses and have not, uh, we've only seen two serious allergic reactions and uh, they, I wouldn't have considered them serious. They weren't considered severe because they didn't need to be admitted to the hospital. They just needed to be treated. Uh, and uh, uh, so as long as you're prepared for that, that's a pretty small number. Thank you. So our next question is, is there a genetic factor between different ethnic groups and how people respond to the virus? Uh, to the virus or the vaccine? The virus? Um, the question says the virus, yes. Yeah, uh, that's a great, that's a fabulous question. And the answer is we will know that, but we don't know that. Uh, there's some hints and suggestions based on some scientific studies, epidemiologic studies, that certain, for instance, certain uh, genetic haplotypes, HLA types, uh, which are genetic haplotypes, or blood types, which are also a genetic haplotype, uh, may respond differently. And there is precedence in medicine that I think most of you know with malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa where, uh, and sickle cell disease. So in, uh, over evolutionary history, infection with malaria appears to have uh, been protective in some ways uh, uh, I'm sorry, sickle cell disease appears to have been prote a protective mechanism for malaria, uh, sort of an evolutionary response of the blood. Uh, so there may, it's likely there'll be some genetic uh, correlations. We just can't speak with certainty now. Certainly we do know though that there's a higher, in, there's, there, that outcomes are worse in our most vulnerable uh, groups, uh, for instance, in people of color, uh, outcomes are worse. Now, the reason the outcomes are worse is multifactorial, and it's not that different from some of the other chronic illnesses, which have worse outcomes, unfortunately, in some of our most vulnerable members of our community, and that's related to socioeconomic factors. It's related to comorbid illnesses, it, and it's related to trust issues. So there's, we have a lot of things we need to do better on, um, and that's something we can actually impact. Thank you. So I think we have time for about two more questions, I was told. So the next one is going to be, do vaccines such as the COVID vaccine increase the risk of blood clots, specifically for those who have a history? Yeah, uh, again, uh, that, that fabulous. There's, as you know, the data on, uh, I think most people are aware, on the AstraZeneca, which is a vector, remember, it's a vectored vaccine out of uh, that right now is, is in use in many parts of the, of the world, but not the United States at this moment, uh, where there's been some association. An association in epidemiology is not causality, it's not proof. It just, what it engenders is exploration. It means there's been an association, so now you need to try to determine if it's cause and effect. To my knowledge, based on what I've read, there's not yet definitive proof of cause and effect, but there's no question there's association. And so we're going to learn more about this. I think it's possible. And similarly, I just saw a paper recently, I think today, about aspirin in patients with COVID, you know, the use of aspirin as a therapeutic, which would, which would support that kind of thinking because aspirin is an uh, anti-clotting, uh, anti-platelet drug. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to follow this but I don't think it's significant. And we haven't seen anything with the current vaccines in use in the United States. Thank you for that. So our last question is going to be, what do you think the timeline will be to get these vaccines FDA approved? Yeah, so I mean, the FDA approval, you know, it's interesting because that's actually, it almost, I don't mean to, to sound cavalier, it's almost less important to me because the most important thing to me now is to get as many of people vaccinated as humanly possible, as fast as possible, so we can get out of this jam we're in. Um, 
I get, I, I'm thinking before 21 ends, we're going to see FDA approval of at least two, if not three of these vaccines, probably the three that are out now. But I think the bigger question is the timeline where, where every adult is going to be eligible in Massachusetts to be vaccinated, meaning every 16 year old and, and older and possibly younger, because those studies are now going on. And I have no reason to believe that a 10 year old shouldn't be vaccinated either. We just don't know that yet. But my guess is, and don't hold me to this, but because this is my reading the tea leaves, my guess is within the next uh, three to eight weeks, four to eight weeks, you know, April and May, basically, I'm thinking the vaccine will be able to be rolled out in Massachusetts to pretty much every adult who wants one. I'm thinking the supply will catch up with the demand and uh, the demand is great. So I would, I, four weeks would be better than eight. Thank you, Dr. Ardenstein. On behalf of the Health Center Advisory Committee, we would like to thank Dr. Ardenstein for his time and wealth of knowledge to present us with the facts about the COVID vaccine. We hope that you found this presentation to be both informative and valuable.